This is Dennis Ramondi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, our podcast and YouTube channel, Spirit Matters Talk, found at spiritmatterstalk.com. If you go to YouTube, just uh, type in Spirit Matters Talk, those three words, and we'll you'll be able to not only hear us, but see us. Uh, we want to uh, begin by thanking everybody out there that's contributed to help keep us on the air. And uh, if anybody wants to do that, just go to spiritmatterstalk.com and It'll all be explained there. And um, uh, we have an archive that, and which we want to keep free and open to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And uh, about 300 shows, interviews in there. And uh, many, many uh, guests that you'll enjoy. And I'm sure you'll enjoy our guest today, Sarah Critchfield. She is vice president uh, for the Fetzer Institute, specifically in the area of uh, movement building. Uh, the Institute's stated mission is helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer's worldview centers around the sacredness of reality, which includes the centrality of spirit, integration of science and spirituality, and the sacredness of all people and the planet, which is a fantastic message considering what's going on today. Uh, it is uh, March 2nd, I think, 2022, uh, just coming out of hopefully a pandemic. But uh, war looms and uh, a lot of fear, a lot of concern and uh, a great message you have. And we, we're going to ask you more about it. So thank you so very much uh, for coming on the show today, taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Uh, Sarah, uh, we should uh, let our guests who are viewing this know that we're recording it as Dennis said, on March 2nd, which is Ash Wednesday. So that explains Sarah's forehead. <laughs> and don't, don't try to wipe your screen. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for being with us. Uh, we, uh, we should say that um, I'm very familiar with the work Fetzer does and uh, has been doing. And uh, was there on the campus in uh, Kalamazoo uh, a few years ago, uh, attending a conference, one of their That's many Kalamazoo, conferences. Michigan. 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 And, um, and um, wanted to have a representative on to talk about Fetzer's work, what they're doing, what they've uh, discovered in all their research and that sort of thing. And, and so thank you for being that representative. And before we get into Fetzer as such, um, tell us a little about yourself and your own background, your own spiritual background, and what brought you to working with Fetzer. Oh, thanks for the question. Um, well, I grew up in Ohio. <clears throat> I was the daughter of a minister who was my mother. Um, and so for me, the um, what's been passed down to me spiritually has come through the maternal lineage. So never, it sort of like never occurred to me in my upbringing, it was like all the women who were, had deeply, deeply faithful grandmothers, like mass every day kind of folks. Um, and so to me, it, it's always the women who carry the spiritual um, weight in the family. The men always did stuff like real estate and insurance and um, things I, I just found a little, um, a little less colorful. So it was clear to me from the beginning that my you know, my heritage was to, was in this sort of spiritual path, um, particularly as a female, which I think was kind of um, illuminated to me when I got older that this isn't this isn't actually the way the rest of this uh, religious <laughs> world always functions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just had I would say I grew up in a very kind of traditional mainline Protestant um, tradition called the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and um, it was very formal and very Protestant. And I had a lot of um, mystic experiences on the side. So very, very young, six years old, having dreams, having visions, having um, experiences that I couldn't explain. And frankly, that I didn't start talking about until much later in life in my thirties. I never said anything to anybody. Sometimes I would mention them to my mother and she'd have me draw them on a piece of paper and sort of smile and nod at me like, mm-hmm. But we didn't really talk about sort of the mystic experience of God because that wasn't so much um, talked about in my tradition. So 
Um, I grew up in, and when I went to college, I started um, learning more about the world, of course, as we do in college and feeling the weight of um, social justice, injustice, and feeling that um, the call from my religious tradition to address these issues. And so I ended up um, working on staff uh, with the United Church of Christ in the Justice and Witness Ministries Office in Washington, DC, doing advocacy. And so that's what I thought my ministry and my, my work would be, that that was what the call was to. So I would say that um, the first third of my career was really dri driven by this question of, of how do laws change? I wanted to change laws and make lives better and help the poor, just like Jesus had commissioned us to do. And I thought the best way to do that was to be in D.C. and to um, and to um, fight injustice and um, do advocacy. And so that was wonderful. Um, what I ended up experiencing in D.C. is, is we would often go into offices and, and a legislator would say, you know, I can sign on to this bill if you can get like six people in my district to call me. And I started thinking, gosh, that's not a lot of people. How come six people yeah. in this whole district aren't interested in, in helping the poor? Like what's going on there? What's going on in people's minds or their awareness or, or what are people paying attention to? So I started asking myself this different question, which is how do minds change? How do minds change as the precursor to how do laws change? And um, I had a really unique opportunity um, with a, with a new startup that was going to think about, this was in 2012, it was going to think about using social media to make social justice issues just as big and just as viral as cat videos. And in 2012, you know, like no self-respecting journalist was on Twitter. Like everybody thought social media was kind of a joke. And so people just sort of thought it was a cute idea. And, um, a group of eight of us uh, were funded by Chris Hughes, one of the original founders of Facebook, to kind of start this media startup thinking through those issues. And within 10 months, we had an audience of 50 million people. It was named the fastest growing media company of all time in 2013. Um, the, the title of that media company was Upworthy.com. So I really did get to answer and, and kind of explore this question on a large stage how do 50 million people's minds work? We did, um, to this day, it's still, Upworthy holds the largest uh, data set of A-B tests in any media company. It's now housed in um, Cornell uh, for study and research. And I learned a lot about how um, our psychology and our, our biology, um, our social behavior kind of affects how we think and then how we act in the world. And after, you know, three years of a spectacularly blazed startup life with 14 hour days, seven days a week, I, I had a spectacularly blazed burnout and um, really hit rock bottom and, and was questioning, um, like, kind of, is this, is this it? And um, started consulting. My life got increasingly more corporate as... Um, as sort of fancier companies wanted to call and use my skill set that I had developed at Upworthy for corporate purposes. And it really just drove me into, you know, a couple years went, went on until I had this wake up call of like, what am I doing? Like, this wasn't the path. Like, I thought about six year old Sarah having those dreams and those visions and thought, I've got to get back to this isn't what I'm what I'm called to do on earth. And so then um, a third question sort of presented itself to me, and that was, how does love work? So I really stretched this gamut from like this experiential, um, experiencing the sacred into how, how do I embody that in my life? And at first it was how do laws work? And then it was how do minds work? How do minds change? And, and next it was how, do, how does love work? And so um, I went back to seminary. So um, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena and really kind of like rerooted in my tradition, which you know, I had had kind of like a wandering spiritual path throughout my adulthood, um, more interspiritual, I'd say. And um, I just thought that I would sort of um, become a, a pastor and just serve that way and really think through love in my own heart, love in other people's hearts and in the world in that capacity. And um, then one day there was a knock on my door and it was the Fetzer Institute. And turns out they were really thinking deeply about how love works and how to make more of it um, and um, how to support it, how to reveal it, how to catalyze it. And I thought, oh, 
uh, these are these are some folks I want to travel with for a while. So here I am, the vice president of movement building for the Fetzer Institute, um, and and we're all just sort of thinking about how does love work together. Well, let, let me ask you then. <clears throat> you you uh, mentioned that when you were young, you had these spiritual experiences that you really didn't discuss or or say out loud probably till you were in your thirties. And I think there are many people that have had that. Uh, did yeah. the, was there anything at the time? that triggered those experiences? Were you able to re-trigger them? And what was the connection with your experiences in regard to spirituality and love and the maybe the connection between the two? How, how do you define all that? Oh, that's, that, that's interesting. So is there anything that triggered them? No, I don't believe so. I think um, my experience has been that there are some, some folks, sometimes there are things that trigger that and for other folks, it's just something that, that they have or that happens to them or that they experience. That just was sort of something that I just had always experienced. Um, I would say it is paired with being a seeker. You know, what I love about um, our founder, John Fetzer, is um, he was quite in the closet for his life, right? His lifetime. He um, lived during a time in, in the um, 20th century where it wasn't cool to be <laughs> anything but a but a but a christian and so he would go to presbyterian church and then kind of um more on the side was exploring all kinds of things psychics and um you know um visions and 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 just he was all over the place right and so i think that that's really the there's this restless curiosity that all humans have um and some of us play that out by looking through a telescope um by really science by trying to understand like how does this world work like what's going on and some of us play that out by just sort of seeking after the sacred by like having an innate sense that there's something that we can't see but that it's very real and that we just keep asking questions about it and so i think that's the type that i am is that that i have this restless curiosity and the more that you know it never becomes about finding the answer but sort of finding the next question to follow, um, which is which is also very in line with sort of, I think how the Fetzer Institute holds um, the swath of historic faith traditions and the spiritual not religious populations um, by saying there's this common ground with, like we all have this restless curiosity in questions and um, the sacred and the unknown beg um, the questions and we can ask them together and learn from each other and how we and how we answer them. So I would just say, like, I, I identify the most probably with a seeker. Um, anywhere there was something sacred, I wanted to be there and experience it. And then, of course, that led me into some other um, experiences. And, and um, I also think that at this point, you know, you can um, call it up call on it. When I was a child, I didn't know how to call on the sacred. It just I just experienced it. Um, and as an adult, I often um, intentionally call on it through various practices. Sarah Lynn, uh, I want to ask about uh, the overview of the Fetzer Institute. And I have to say, because you mentioned its founder, when I was there attending a, a conference, I, there, I went into the main building and there's a display, sort of a little museum. Mm -hmm. uh, thing and I realized why the name Fetz. I knew Fet the Institute because it had funded uh, various things that I, I I was interested in, and I knew people who had gone there for uh, uh, conferences and to do research, and um, and I was familiar with some of the research findings. But the name was always familiar. And then when I was in the display section, I realized why. It's because the founder owned the Detroit Tigers. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had heard the name as, a, you know, growing up as a baseball fan. So I found that fascinating because to me, baseball is a, a doorway into the sacred. And so it must have been for him <laughs> on some level, too. But tell us, tell us a bit about what, what is the overriding purpose of the Institute and uh, why you're excited to be part of it? Great. Um, the overriding purpose. Well, I, I would say this. Um, our, our founder was, was very unique in that um, the, um, 
the stated mission and the, and the commission that he really left was to listen to spirit, that he really believed in the ability of a group of um, seekers to get together and to discern and listen into sacred mystery together to discern the next step. And so the, um, so the trajectory was left wide open, whereas other founders are very prescriptive in how they want the mission to be carried out. So the Institute has had um, three main phases. And the first phase was really emblematic of what John Fetzer was most interested in during his um, living years, which were, uh, which was the mind-body health connection. And he really believed there was something there. And this is in the 70s, 80s. This is before it's, you know, it was mainstreamed. And so the Fetzer Institute did a lot of the early research um, funded a lot of the early research and really put in on that mind body health connection. Um, we're doing some of that to this day, still funding um, the chaplaincy innovation lab, right? Like we know that um, patients have better outcomes, health outcomes with spiritual support while they're in hospital settings. Um, that really dates back to John Fetzer's inkling that this, that he's onto something. How do we, how do we heal ourselves by integrating um, the whole person and not just parts of the person? So that was really kind of like the first phase of the work at Fetzer Institute. After, um, 2001, um, after 9-11 happened, the board got together and started to discern kind of a new direction. And that launched us into the phase that was called the Campaign for Love and Forgiveness. And so I think as a, as a response to what was going on, as a response to what the world most desperately needed at that time um, that the board could discern, we did a lot of work in um, finding exemplaries in love and forgiveness, research in love and forgiveness. And um, you know, while it was a little more abstract than that mind-body health connection, um, what we did see and could measure was that there was a, a huge uptick in research around love and forgiveness at the time that um, Fetzer was campaigning around the benefits of this um, academic research. And so that's an enormously important, um, particularly in our sort of like uh, post-enlightenment world, post-modern world, where, you know, um, just having a belief that the things unseen are valid as they are isn't enough. Like, we have to also kind of um, have some scientific validation. So the Institute's always been, from the beginning, really interested in marrying these, like, scientific ways of knowing with the spiritual ways of knowing, that there's no conflict between those, but that they're, they're two different ways of knowing and that they complement each other and they benefit humanity and the world. So that sort of went until 2016. Um, and then in 2016, our, our president, our current president, Bob Boister, um, came on the scene and really made sort of a, a momentous decision, um, which is at that point, the board decided to sort of reject the conventional wisdom of right-sizing the mission to sort of fit the staff and, and the financial resources. And instead they committed to right-sizing them to fit the needs of the world. And so that's where the mission, building um, the spiritual foundation for a loving world was born. And um, the call that sort of we, I guess that the Institute really regrounded in sacred reality at that time, um, really committed to the idea that um, there is a belief that, um, that there is spirit, capital S, spirit. And by, by saying that, what we mean is spirit is the source of love, is the ground of love, um, comes to us on many different paths in many different ways. Um, so so uh, the call was really to sort of look at this like global kind of movement in the human family towards um, towards love as an operating system, love as a strategy for dealing with the world's biggest problems. Like, how do we take love really seriously um, and playing it out in the world? And we did some, um, we started kind of deepening into sector work. So there was an initiative, Healing the Heart of American Democracy. Phil, I think you came to a convening in that initiative um, that really deals with sort of like polarization and um, bridge building and using love as the healing ingredient for our democracy. Um, there's spirituality and education. So focusing on whole child development and um, deepening into the work the Institute had already done in education, which was we did a lot of funding for the research that um, that was the 
the beginning of SEL, social emotional learning in K through 12 education. We're, we're now expanding that to include um, even broader child development to include the spiritual development, that the social and emotional aspects aren't enough for um, a toolkit for life that you've got to support the spiritual development of children in education. Um, and then we did some spiritual innovation and in, in sort of network weaving initiatives. So those things I mentioned, like supporting chaplains, um, doing supporting retreat centers, um, these pieces of infrastructure in our society that support spiritual development um, across the lifespan. Um, so that's been kind of our work. And at this point now, 2022, that was sort of like the, the start, the foundation. And um, we're, we're, it, we're actually in another moment where we're discerning a new thing together. It's been quite exciting. It's been a really, really exciting time since I came on. They hired, um, we hired sort of a cadre of new folks about a year and a half ago. And we all got to sort of spend some time reimagining on how to, how to kind of expand the vision even further. Um, so we're, we're kind of turning a little bit from um, supporting specific projects as individual projects and thinking more about how to catalyze a movement. Like, how do you really, and so there comes in my title, like, how do you really do movement building? How do you support an entire global movement for human um, and societal transformation in a spiritual way. This is not something that like we know of any other organization that's really sort of taking that on, that whole scope. And um, so we've been doing a lot of dreaming and visioning and inviting folks to help us think through um, how movements work, how FETSER can best, best support and inspire this global movement and catalyze it. But we're really looking um, for the next decade of our work to deepen into this movement building model um, versus kind of like the, the programmatic or the, or the project funding model. So it's going to be a really I, exciting decade for us. I, I want to ask, uh, you, you, you mentioned that you, using love to, to heal democracy and mm -hmm. creating a movement, and I assume a movement to use love uh, to heal not only democracy, to, but to heal uh, all uh, uh, social institutions. But it, it's very abstract uh, to say that. Give us a concrete example of how uh, Fetzer Institute would, uh, would 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 move forward with that. Would actually uh, institute a program, or what mm -hmm. would that movement try to initiate or uh, uh, start, so that it it, it comes out of the abstract and it's not just a concept for people to think about, but it it hits in a real way. Yeah, thanks for that question. That is sometimes the um, trickiness of Fetzer of like that people say this sounds great. This is so inspiring. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so, so part of what we do is um, research, right? That's the institute side of us. That's the thinking, that's a, sort of the learning think tank side of us. And um, so we're supporting um, research in conjunction with UNICEF now around what does whole child development look like that includes spirituality? So we're funding research around the nine core capacities that children need with the Learning um, for Wellbeing Foundation and UNICEF and FETS are in partnership to provide this grounding for policy change because we know policies can't change in education unless we've got research to prove that this benefits children across lifespan. Um, so this is really fascinating you know, research to me that um, that the, that the nine core capacities, and they're of course, they're very applicable to adults, um, are, let me read them to you. They're um, discerning patterns, embodying, empathizing, inquiring, listening, observing, reflecting, relaxing, or rest, and sensing. So if you think about the world's historic traditions or you think about spiritual traditions, these capacities are, are needed in order to engage in those traditions. So first thing is we're doing the research. Second thing is we're funding pilot projects to sort of prove out business work in the real world. So one of the pilot projects that I love is um, the QUESTION project and it's Q-U-E-S-T in all caps. And this is a pilot um, sort of spiritual capacity core development program that's being run in 10 high schools in Brooklyn and yeah. um, 10 high school, um, 10 high schools are implementing the question class. And so this is a one hour class 
where um, students are coming and they're asking things like, what are we doing here? What is my purpose? What, oh. what makes a good life? How do I be a good citizen? Um, what brings me joy? What is joy, right? So asking these inquiries together with their peers, with some um, structured framework, um, with, with um, trained teachers. And, um, you know, obviously the kids love it because high school kids are asking these questions. They're, they're ripe with the, the, like, how does the world work? How did I get here? What will I do? What does it all mean? They have so many questions. And what we do is we say, here, learn calculus, right? <laughs> what we do is we say, study harder, learn better, get into the best school, make money. And they've got questions about what's going on in their spirit. Um, so, um, you know, integrating that into a school system in a way that's constitutionally respectful, spiritually multilingual, um, that's not something that we, those aren't sort of capacities that we as a society have in the, in the sector of education. It's very terrifying. Um, nobody likes spirituality in schools. Liberals don't like it because they don't want anyone teaching religion. Conservatives don't like it because you're not teaching their religion, right? Like there's a lot right. of opposition from, from everywhere, but who's benefiting from this proven out by research is the students, yes. the kids who need this, this support in this capacity development. So so adults flexing our muscles and learning how to do this in a constitutionally, spiritually multilingual way is really what we need. And so the other piece of what we do in our democracy portfolio is support, um, provide a lot of support for um, CASEL, the collaboration for social emotional learning, for helping um, sort of the policymakers really like understand how to um, flex those muscles that are, that are quite new. Is that Sarah, helpful? I would think that Okay. I would I, think, I, I, by the way, at some point, <clears throat> maybe on another show, I'd really like to follow up on those 10 schools in Brooklyn. Is it you said in Brooklyn that are, which is where Phil's from, by the way. Uh, where, yeah, maybe it's my old high school. It could be. Yeah. So, we, I could connect you with the question project. They're amazing. I'll be curious. That'd be great. They're amazing. Um, Sarah, um, I'm guessing that when you tell people, uh, you're researching or, or you're, you're the movement building for uh, uh, love, you get a lot of rolled eyes because <clears throat> if you're a certain age, you remember make love, not war and other, you know, hippie slogans that we thought would change the world and didn't quite work out as well as we thought. Um, so, and I've often wondered when I hear people say, oh, let's all love each other and it, we have to respect each other and you have to be kind to each other. And we have to love one another. We have to, that what's missing from these formulas is how do you cultivate in human beings the capacity for love and the willingness to express love and, and, and all that? Is that part? of the research, is that what you're pointing to with these, these, these studies is, you know, how do we, it's, it, it, people have been implored to love one another for thousands of years. That seems to not be enough. How do you create the, you know, un, bring out the love that we have? <clears throat> right. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm gonna say like, I don't have a real clear answer to that. That's why I'm at the Fetzer Institute. That's what we're all doing here on earth, isn't right. it? We're just all trying to sort of figure that out. So it's, um, and there, to me, this is, the, this, is, this is the work. There's no other work to be doing our <laughs> time here on earth. Um, I implore all of us to be just asking this question um, all the time. But what I will say is, I'll say, I'll say one thing, um, and perhaps this just comes, this just comes, you know, from an, an authentic position of a person of faith. I don't think it's as bad as we think it is. I actually think people are pretty good at loving. Like I look around and the people that I know, I like, I'm looking at you too. And I'm sure that you love well, wherever you are. I'm sure that you love your families and that you love your neighbors and that you do the absolute best you can every day as do I try. Right. So I think it's not quite as, um, like this is the one thing around, around the messaging, which I also kind of do the messaging piece for the Institute. Um, when you say to people like, you just need to be loving, like people kind of say like, yeah, I'm on, I'm on board, like I get it. And so, 
So it's like, <clears> how do we sort of see, um, how do we measure or sort of see different sort of behavioral sh shifts? How do we get into um, global systems, um, government systems that will that will sort of support and engender a loving response versus um, an antagonistic response, right? So, so there's some systemic issues that put us all into um, players in in a in a game that we can't that's like hard to wiggle out of. So these questions are complex. Um, I certainly think that research is a place to start, and so um, the institute's very committed to that. One of the other pieces of research that we're doing is the Global Flourishing Study. Um, and this is being done by uh, Baylor University, Gallup. It's a um, multi-million dollar study over five years. There's never been a study, I can, I should shoot off some information about this, but there's never been a study that has been this comprehensive. It spans 20 countries, millions of people. And one of the reasons that Fetzer is interest, interested in co-funding um, this initiative is to include spirituality in a marker of human flourishing, right? It's, it's like what you measure is what you pay attention to. So we've been measuring GDP and then we, and then, you know, some more kind of advanced countries start measuring happiness, right? But happiness is not the same as joy. It's not the same as fulfillment. Um, all of our spiritual traditions tell us that there's something deeper than happiness in human fulfillment and purpose. So how does faith spirituality actually um, play into the markers of human flourishing? And how can we prove that out in a, in a flourishing study that then translates into policy changes that gets us some systemic relief from the kind of um, from the kind of policy that we created in order to produce better GDP or in order to produce um, more happiness. So I think that's like one way to do it. Um, and then the other way to do it is really to sort of support that personal transfer transformation. And that's where there's a real question. Like I have a question about how does personal transformation work? Like if we like, can you figure it out? I, I think the answer is no. I don't think... <laughs> you can figure it out because there's so much sacred mystery in in our, our own experience of personal transformation but we do attempt to um, support initiatives that do support personal transformation for example retreat centers right so we've network weaved retreat centers and retreat center leaders together because we know those spaces for quiet contemplation and rest are spaces where you can experience this opening this tr this transformation and then we trust we trust people that when they experience this, that they'll go forth in the world and that goodness will come of it. So it's a, it's a bit of, it's a bit of art. It's a bit of science and it's a bit of inquiry. Right. Th thank you, by the way, <clears throat> for that answer. And uh, because I find myself <clears throat> these days, uh, I'm an optimistic person, but I find myself slipping occasionally into pessimism. And it's good to be reminded that if we do look around, <clears throat> there's a lot of good uh, in the present and, and there. Uh, my, my final question, and I'll turn it over to Phil, is um, if somebody wanted to get uh, find out more about the Fetzer Institute or perhaps even get involved or perhaps even support some of the initiatives of the Institute, uh, how would they do that? Great. Um, you can visit us at Fetzer.org, sign up for our uh, monthly newsletter, um, and uh, all of our latest news and ways to get involved and things come out, come out in that. Um, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or LinkedIn. And um, you can also just um, be in the quiet reality that you are loved, that you came from loved and that you will love. And that would be a wonderful support to the Fetzer Institute. Thanks for that, Sarah. I really wanted to get into some of the research that Fetzer has done. We don't have much time I'm still left. Here. You can't see me, but I'm still here. But I have no, to we see you. Audio. Yeah. Um, um, I've looked at some of the research and uh, we don't have much time, but let's focus on one of the research projects that, because it was only a year or so ago, the uh, What Does Spirituality Mean to Us? Uh, uh, project and you know I was looking over those findings. Um, tell us a little bit about that and um, if you can briefly summarize the findings. Great. I'll start with just a, a plug that if you want to learn about the um, spirituality study or download the full report for free, you can go to spiritualitystudy.fetzer.org. Um, 
so we did a, a spirituality study um, with the question, what does spir spirituality mean to us in the US? And um, this was completed in 2020. So it was right before I came on. So I'm going to try to do it justice. Um, I may not. But um, what I thought was so fascinating about this study, and, and as a person who's, you know, been religious my whole life and spiritual, I, I identify as spiritual and religious, and I identify as very spiritual and very <laughs> religious. Of course, I've always followed like the Pew studies and the um, like what's the changing landscape in U.S. culture and, um, how, you know, what's kind of popping in, in the global south and sort of receding in the global north. And, and these kinds of trends were always really fascinating to me. When I read the spirituality study, what I saw was pictures. Like when you read the when you read the, the book, what you see is pictures. And so what this study did that was very fetzery <laughs> um, was it brought people together and it said, don't just tell us what spirituality means to you. Draw it. There are different ways to explain. So again, this this nod that we often ask people about heart. We often ask people to explain heart knowledge with head knowledge. And so you get this kind of like um, garbled translation as the heart knowledge moves through the, the head and tries to come out. And so when you ask people through verbal means to explain what spirituality means to them, you do they do tend to sort of stay in this realm of explaining things in very religious terms, because those are, those are the formal structures by which we have tended as humans to, to try to make sense, do sense making around this, this kind of heart stuff and this kind of sacred mystery stuff. So when you let people draw, it turns out um, just what turns, what we learned was the range is much larger than we thought, right? Mm. So, um, <clears throat> so people who will um, describe themselves as um, not one, one, one picture that was very, very moving to me, um, Daniel, 20 years old, described himself as very spiritual, not religious at all. And then he drew a picture of himself on his knees, right down before Jesus praying. <laughs> and he said, I just talked to God a lot. It just, it just means praying, having a connection. Right? <laughs> But when you ask him in words, are you religious? He said, no, 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 not religious at all. So what, what's happening is like, we're actually missing um, people's full experience because we're asking them to translate heart knowledge as through their head. Um, so, I mean, that's that you can see some of these pictures. If you go onto the website, um, you can kind of explore um, what, what was the key findings. It's an interactive website. So there's findings around um, visualizing and verbalizing spirituality. The other thing that was interesting that we discovered was um, there was a strong correlation between pro-social behaviors like volunteering, donating, voting, um, and uh, stronger identification with spirituality or religion. So in other words, the more spiritual or religious you identified as, the more pro-social behaviors you exhibited. What was interesting about this study is that we did um, discussion groups. They did a lot of like focus groups, smaller focus groups. And most people didn't connect their spiritual or religious beliefs with their pro-social action. So like for me, as a young, as a 22-year-old straight out of college, I was off to DC because that's what Jesus wanted me to do. And gosh darn it, I was clear on it. You know what I mean? It was a very clear connection and framework. Most people... Um, have pro-social behavior and can't connect it back into their um, experience until they talk about it. Huh. So through the focus groups and through dialoguing with each other, their eyes were open to say, oh my gosh, I do do these things because of my <laughs> spiritual beliefs. I didn't know it. So there's a lot of things that are sort of innate that aren't kind of brought up in us until we sort of discuss and dialogue, which is why community is always such an important part of spirituality and religious um, traditions. And, um, just, just a, a slew of other things. Of course, this study, kind of the way it was done, opened up a lot of other questions, like are those pro-social behaviors, uh, is it correlation or causation? And so we're doing some follow-up research to kind of wind down the rabbit hole of those, of those questions. Um, it, it was a lovely, elegant study, um, spacious. There's a lot of space, spaciousness in the study. So oh. I encourage you to explore it on your own. Um, and I'll look forward to the follow-up studies. Um, 
So thanks for being with us. Thank thanks for much. letting us know about <clears throat> you and the Fetzer Institute. I encourage everybody to go to the Fetzer website and at, at the very least peruse all their research uh, findings over the years. You'll we'll see, have all of that posted up. You know, we'll okay. have links on, on, on the uh, website. Thank you again, Sarah. Good luck with all your uh, upcoming work. Uh, and uh, please convey our best wishes to all the good people at Fetzer. Congratulations on your work. And I do definitely want to follow up on that program in Brooklyn and, and some of your other programs. Fascinating. Thank you so very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Philip. Okay. Take care. Yes, Phil, Sarah Critchfield from the Fetzer Institute, uh, tremendously uh, enthusiastic and uh, spirited herself about yes. what, uh, what they're doing, and they're doing great work. I, uh, you are more familiar with the Fetzer Institute than I am. I uh, read a lot about it, and, and at first, actually, when you mentioned the interview, I was wondering how it related to contemporary spirituality, but in fact, it absolutely relates to contemporary spirituality, and uh and taking a, a multilingual approach to uh, describing yeah. and talking about spirituality. I like that term she used because- I uh, did too. Yeah, I've been aware of the Fetzer Institute for a long time. Mm -hmm. I remember you know, hearing about some of the projects they funded uh, you know, for research purposes and developmental purposes over the years. And you know, the Krista Tippett's uh, a radio program that she's been having for, you know, that's been on, on uh, public radio for many years uh, is funded partially by the Fetzer and um, many other programs. And then I was part of a program. I was invited uh, the, uh, what, what, what used to be a magazine, the online uh, spirituality and practice uh, website, which is, you know, quite, quite an enterprise in itself. They had a project uh, co-sponsored with the Fetzer, and I was there on the campus for a few days as part of that. And I was very impressed with the people and the setting and what they this do. This is a campus in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Right, yeah. In, and in they the have woods. retreats there, don't they have retreats? People going to actually go and- But I think they're retreats. mostly, yeah, I don't know if they have just spiritual retreats. Uh, I know they, they probably have them for the people who work at Fetzer, right. but they have retreats, uh, you know, sort of working retreats, sort of retreat slash conferences, I know. Um, and, um, it's a great setting and, and they do very good work. And one of the things that stood out was in uh, their description. You know, when I, I said, I contacted them because they had a study that we meant, we discussed at the end of the interview with Sarah uh, about contemporary spirituality that I thought was very revealing about, you know, how people understand spirituality and what it means, how they, how they, um, understand what's a spirituality to be. And um, uh, I would encourage people who are interested to go and look at that results right. of that study. But when I contacted them and said, we'd like to speak to a representative, they, they suggested Sarah. I was surprised that she's only been there a short time, relatively, you know, a couple of years. But um, her mandate is apparently, you know, this public outreach kind of thing and uh, as she put it movement building so right, i can right. see why they suggested her it's fascinating yeah. so she she uh, i think it would be perfect for the job she obviously uh it, it has moved her spiritually i mean she's very enthused about it and very articulate in explaining it and uh it sort of you know definitely inspired my interest to find out more about it and uh that some of the programs like well after the interview uh uh to our listeners uh uh, we spoke to her a bit about different people she'd recommend for uh, Spirit Matters Talk to come on, and uh, all you know, extremely interesting. And also, I, that that program they're running in Brooklyn in the ten schools. I, I'm wondering yeah. how they the schools, great, right? and asking the questions how they train the teacher, what the curriculum actually is. I would have loved something 
like that when I was in high school, as opposed to like trigonometry or something. But I, but we would have remembered a lot more from it than I do did from trig and other, some other subjects. But uh, those yeah. are the kinds of things that I think kids really are hungry for, and and uh, you know, are, and often are difficult to get in the schools because there's always some group uh, that's opposed to. <coughs> it's funny. You can talk about war. You can talk about you know anything you want to talk about in school. But when it comes to spirituality, it's like you can talk about it but only if it's done in the way that I see spirituality in the way I see religion. And it's, it's really limited. I don't even think you can teach contemporary religion in, uh, I mean, uh, uh, comparative religions in high school. Uh, unless yeah, depend, school depending on the school district, but I, I, I think, in a, I don't know any public schools that teach comparative religions and not until you get to college because there'd always be somebody complaining about it. So yeah, uh, yeah interesting, but uh, I, obviously the Fetzer Institute is doing some, Really fabulous work. They they are apparently ex extremely well funded. Tell us about the connection with the uh, Detroit Tigers. Oh, just that the founder uh, Bill Fetzer, I think it was Bill Bill Fetzer, yeah, um, was the owner of the Detroit Tigers. I don't know where the family money came from, but uh, <laughs> they own, <laughs> they he he owned the Detroit Tigers at a certain point in baseball history right. and um when i was there and i saw the displays about the history of fetzer and all stuff i i discovered that and you know there's baseball memorabilia there and you, you, you see uh, <clears throat> baseball is a sport that's a, a door into the spiritual do you not i well you know people people have always uh it, baseball has always attracted great writers. You know, people like John Updike. There's a famous New Yorker article about Ted Williams' last baseball game that was written by John Updike, and it's a fabulous piece of literature, but in the baseball settings. And, and, and people always discuss why is that so, and it's because baseball is a more contemplative sport to watch than say basketball or football or hockey because there's 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 moments of where Sorry. nothing is happening right many moments there's, there's periods <laughs> of silence in between pitches right and in between innings and 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 it's you look out at this landscape and they all people talk about the symbolism of the foul lines going off in in directions into infinity, unlike, right, right. And it, unlike well, the, the rectangle of a football field or a basketball court. Okay. And, and, and I often wonder, I often wonder what the right fielder who hasn't had a ball hit to him in eight innings yes. is thinking all, all, during all that time out there. He's restfully alert. He, yes. he has to be alert or she has to be alert the whole time. But at the same time, nothing is going on. Often. Right. There's and, a, and, 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 if you're if you're a you know a starting player, you have to wait for eight other guys to come to bat before you go to bat. <laughs> so what? And you're sitting there. A lot of time in the involved. dugout. Yeah. But if you're a fan, there's times when you're just sitting, and you know it's very contemplative. The other thing people talk about with baseball is that unlike the other sports, it's not timed. A baseball game can be you know, an hour and a half or eight hours. <laughs> so, right. so it's yeah, timeless. Yeah, it's, it's, There's time is suspended. Yeah. Anyway, that's hey, uh, we're off topic here. If found, uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if there's any literature anywhere where Mr. Fetzer, the founder of the Fetzer Institute, gave that any thought. I'm, I'm sure they. Really I don't know. That would be you interesting. Know. I, you know, he obviously loved baseball and, and, and he was a deeply spiritual guy. So he's my kind of guy, but um, we don't know. But Fetzer is doing great work. And I, I look forward to hearing uh, more in the future about what they come up with next. And I would, one of the interesting things about this 2020 study they did about contemporary spirituality is they found a link between people's commitment to their spiritual life and their social concerns. Uh -huh. 
people people who identified as spiritual or religious or both uh, tended to have more uh, either uh, involvement in or and concern about uh, issues around uh, so social issues, social concerns. Interesting. Well, great, great interview. I'd love to have okay. Sarah back on the show. <clears throat> Many other areas we could cover. And uh, good one, Phil. Till next time. Okay. And Don't forget, you. listeners and viewers, to hit the subscribe button. Yes, the subscribe button. And if you do want to contribute to help keep us going uh, and keep our archives open, uh, spiritmatterstalk.com. Go there. It'll all be explained to you. All right. Till okay. next time.